From World War I until the first year of World War II, small-caliber anti-tank guns, such as the 37mm in its various forms, had adequate penetration for practically all tanks, and were light enough to be manhandled. As World War II progressed, tank armor, and the necessity for AT guns to overcome heavier armor increased at a rapid pace. The Russians went from 14.5mm up to 85mm anti-tank guns. The British progressed from 0.55 boys up to the 17-pounder. The United States, which started rearming later, went from 37mm up to 90mm AT guns. Germany progressed from 37mm up to 88mm anti-tank guns. The weight of the gun needed to handle the cartridge seemed to triple with each increase in AT power. It progressed from sub 500 kg to 7 ton cannons. Moving these massive anti tank weapons around the battlefield was becoming increasingly difficult for the armies. To transport the guns, the semi motorized German military used horses or half tracks. Trucks and half-tracks were used by motorized armies like the Western Powers. The guns were fine, but because they can't move quickly and take time to set up and disassemble, a self-propelled anti-tank gun was a necessary solution to the problem that also fit with the doctrines at the time. The tank destroyer was designed to address this problem, which was exacerbated on the Eastern Front due to mud and a lack of paved roads. A fully tracked or at least half-tracked tank destroyer could give the anti-tank guns immense mobility, as they were now too heavy to move without off-road mechanization. After 1940, the Germans had tens of thousands of obsolete Panzer I and II tanks, and hundreds of war-bounty French tanks. The turrets of these fully tracked, but outdated carriers could not accommodate bigger guns, However, if the turret is removed from, and an AT gun is bolted to the chassis, they could carry a considerably larger caliber weapon on a fully mechanized chassis. As a result, the Germans came up with the idea of retrofitting old tank chassis with anti-tank guns. These vehicles were initially known as Panzerjägers. The first was the Panzerjäger I which was based on the Panzer I light tank and included a Czech-made 47mm AT gun. This and succeeding Panzerjägers featured an open-top crew compartment, little crew protection, and simply a gun shield in this case. Now, the Germans repurposed other outdated chassis to kickstart their Martyr series, as well as to develop enclosed tank destroyers such as the Hetzer, using the Panzer II and 38T respectively. The Germans had upgunned their infantry assault gun, the Sturmgeschütz III, with a long barrel 75mm cannon by this point. The Stug was Germany's most produced fully tracked fighting vehicle in World War II. It was an especially effective vehicle once it was upgraded with a high-velocity anti-tank gun. The Germans found that tank destroyers were much cheaper than tanks, and very useful once they were on the defensive. Now, instead of employing old chassis, the Germans began modifying the chassis of very useful tanks such as the Panzer IV, Panther, and Tiger into tank destroyers. For the United States, tank destroyers were a knee-jerk reaction to the German Blitzkrieg attacks. The US developed the tank destroyers as a new defensive arm of the service, whose duty was to sit behind the main line of defense, ready to rush the point of breakthrough, and function as a fire brigade to close the gap. They needed high mobility for this role, which meant minimal armor, but since they would be attacking the flank of a breakthrough, that was acceptable. The early design included an M3 half-track, with a 75mm cannon mounted on it. 
This was immediately followed by the development of the M10 on a Sherman chassis with a 3-inch cannon, and later the M36 with a 90mm gun. The M18 with a 76mm gun, which was very light, fast, and effective with minimal armor, was arguably the best tank destroyer created by the United States. By the time the US entered the war in Europe, the situation for both Britain and the US had changed, and the armies were now geared for offensive operations, leaving the tank destroyer arm without a primary purpose. As a result, they were sent out to combat commands, and used primarily as anti-tank units rather than the battalion-sized units intended. By the end of the war, the tank design concept had crystallized around the main battle tank, since power plants had improved to the point where acceptable armor and mobility could be achieved. The Soviets tended to follow the German style of turretless hulls, with medium and heavy types of tank destroyers. They used the T-34 chassis in the form of the Su-85 and Su-100. The KV and IS chassis was used to create the Su-152, and the ISU-122 and ISU-152. However, the Soviets never came to rely upon tank destroyers to the same extent as the Germans did. The German use of tank destroyers was forced on them. However, for the Germans, tank destroyers were equally as effective, if not more so than panzers, with the Stug III being the best example. It was the most common German armored vehicle, with 10,000 constructed, and claimed to have destroyed no less than 20,000 enemy tanks. Despite weak armor and a lackluster gun, the M18 Hellcat had the highest kill-loss ratio of any American fielded vehicle in the entire war. Only in August 1944, the 630th Tank Destroyer Battalion, using the Hellcat exclusively, knocked out 54 Panthers and Tigers, along with many other smaller tanks, while only losing 17 of their own. At the Battle of Aerocourt, the Hellcats destroyed nearly 20 Panthers and Panzer IVs, while only losing three of their own. And this is where we get to the crux of the issue. Each of these vehicles was intended for a specific job and failed miserably in others. The Jagd Tiger had poor mobility, and relatively weak side and rear armor. The Hetzer and Stug F were poor anti-infantry vehicles, with their fixed guns and few machine guns. Meanwhile, the US Sherman, with its 105mm howitzer, could storm defenses or provide infantry support, and with its 76mm, it was capable of killing tanks. The Russian T-3485 could also perform a number of different tasks. It was significantly more logical to build a single tank that could accomplish almost all tasks. The concept of the universal tank, or the main battle tank, was born. Special purpose vehicles, such as the various self-propelled guns of World War II, particularly tank destroyers, were no longer strategically viable. More importantly, tanks, particularly later main battle tanks, provided commanders more tactical flexibility. The tank destroyers were certainly efficient a lot of the time, when it came to their specific task of killing tanks cheaply. But they were no more practical, and every major power since World War II has reached the same conclusion. They simply weren't worth the additional supply and logistical costs, especially once military technology made the main battle tank a practical reality. If you have enjoyed the video, please subscribe and support the channel for more. Many thanks for watching.